Hey friends, here we are back with holes. And when we finished, Stanley is just trying to figure out what KB stands for. Kissing Kate Barlow, who was an outlaw. And he's starting to figure out that the warden is looking for stuff from her. So now let's see what happens. 110 years ago, Green Lake was the largest lake in Texas. It was full of clear, cool water and it sparkled like a giant emerald in the sun. It was especially beautiful in the spring when the peach trees which lined the shore bloomed with pink and rose-colored blossoms. There was always a town picnic at the 4th of July. They'd play games, dance, sing, and swim in the lake to keep cool. Prizes were awarded for the best peach pie and the peach jam. A special prize was given away every year to, to Miss Catherine Barlow for her fabulous spiced peaches. No one, <coughs> excuse me, no one else even tried to make spiced peaches because they knew none could be as delicious as hers. Every summer, Miss Catherine would pick bushels of peaches and preserve them in jars of cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg, and other spices, which she kept secret. The jarred peaches would last all winter. They probably would have lasted a lot longer than that, but they were always eaten by the end of winter. It was said that Green Lake was heaven on earth and that Miss Catherine's spiced peaches were the food of the angels. Catherine Barlow was the town's only school teacher. She taught in an old room schoolhouse. It was even old then. The roof leaked, the windows wouldn't open, and the door hung crooked on its bent hinges. She was a wonderful teacher, full of knowledge and full of life. The children loved her. She taught classes in the evening for adults, and many of the adults loved her as well. She was very pretty, and her classes were often full of young men who were a lot more interested in the teacher than they were in getting an education. But all they ever got was an education. One such man was Trout Walker. His real name was Charles Walker, but everyone called him Trout because he, his two feet smelled a, smelled a lot like a couple of dead fish. This wasn't entirely Trout's fault. He had an incurable foot fungus. In fact, it was the same foot fungus that 110 years later would afflict the famous ball player Clyde Livingstone. But at least Clyde Livingstone showered every day. I take a bath every Sunday morning, Trout would brag, whether I need one or not. Most everyone in the town of Green Lake expected Miss Catherine to marry Trout Walker. He was the son of the richest man in the county. His family owned most of the peach trees and all the land on the east side of the lake. Trout often showed up at night school but never paid attention. He talked in class and was disrespectful to the students around him. He was loud and stupid. A lot of men in town were not educated. That didn't bother Miss Catherine. She knew they spent most of their lives working on farms and ranches and hadn't had much schooling. That was why she was there, to teach them. But Trout didn't want to learn. He seemed to be proud of his stupidity. How'd you like to take a ride on the new boat this Saturday, he asked her one evening after class. No, thank you, said Miss Catherine. We've got a brand new boat, he said. You don't even have to row it. Yes, I know, said Miss Catherine. Everyone in town had seen and heard the walker's new boat. It made a horrible loud noise and spewed ugly black smoke over the beautiful lake. Trout had always gotten everything he ever wanted. He found it hard to believe that Miss Catherine had turned him down. He pointed his finger at her and said, no one ever says no to Charles Walker. Well, I believe I just did, said Catherine Barlow. So Stanley was f half asleep as he got in line for breakfast, but the sight of Mr. Sir awakened him. The left side of Mr. Sir's face had swollen to the size of half a cantaloupe. There were three dark purple jagged lines running down his cheek where the warden had scratched him. The other boys in Stanley's tent had obviously seen Mr. Sir too but they had the good sense not to say anything. Stanley put a carton of juice and plastic spoon on his tray. He kept his eyes down and hardly breathed as Mr. Sir ladled some oatmeal-like stuff into his bowl. He brought his tray to the table, and behind him a boy from one of the other tents said, Hey, what happened to your face? There was a crash. Stanley turned to see Mr. Sir holding the boy's head against the oatmeal pot. Is something wrong with my face? The boy tried to speak but couldn't. Mr. Sir had him by the throat. Does anyone see anything wrong with my face? asked Mr. Sir as he continued to choke the boy. Nobody said anything. Mr. Sir let the boy go and his head banged against the table as he fell to the ground. Mr. Sir stood over him and asked, How does my face look to you now? A gurgling sound came up out of the boy's mouth. Then he managed to gasp the word, uh, Fine! I'm kind of handsome, don't you think? Uh, yes, Mr. Sir. Out on the lake, the other boys asked Stanley what he knew about Mr. Sir's face, but he just shrugged and dug his hole. If he didn't talk about it, maybe it would go away. He worked as hard and as fast as he could, not trying to pace himself. 
He just wanted to get off the lake and away from Mr. Sir as soon as possible. Besides, he knew he'd get a break. Whenever you're ready, just let me know, Zero had said. The first time the water truck came, it was driven by Mr. Pendansky. The second time, Mr. Sir was driving. No one said anything except, Thank you, Mr. Sir, as he filled each canteen. No one dared to look at his grotesque face. As Stanley waited, he ran his tongue over the roof of his mouth and inside his cheeks. His mouth was as dry as a parch and parched as the lake. The bright sun reflected off the side mirror of the truck, and Stanley had to shield his eyes with his hand. Thank you, Mr. Sir, said Magnet, as he took his canteen from him. You thirsty, caveman? Mr. Sir asked. Yes, Mr. Sir, Stanley said, handing his canteen to him. Mr. Sir opened the nozzle, and the water flowed out of the tank, but it did not go into Stanley's canteen. Instead, he held the canteen right next to the stream of water. Stanley watched the water splatter onto the dirt, where it was quickly absorbed by the thirsty ground. Mr. Sir let the water run for the, about 30 seconds, then stopped. You want more? he asked. Stanley didn't say anything. Mr. Sir turned the water back on, and again Stanley watched it pour into the dirt. There, that should be plenty, he handed Stanley his empty canteen. Stanley stared at the dark spot on the ground, which quickly shrunk before his eyes. Thank you, Mr. Sir, he said. There was a doctor in the town of Green Lake 110 years ago. His name was Dr. Hawthorne. And whenever people got sick, they would go see Doc Hawthorne. But they would also see Sam, the onion man. Onions! Sweet, fresh onions! Sam would call as he and his donkey, Mary Lou, walked up and down the dirt roads of Green Lake. Mary Lou pulled a cart full of onions. Sam's onion field was somewhere on the other side of the lake. Once or twice a week, he would row across the lake and pick a new batch of filled the cart. Sam had big, strong arms, but it would take all day long for him to row across the lake and another day for him to return. Most of the time, he would leave Mary Lou in a shed, and when the walkers let him use, that the walkers let him use at no charge. But sometimes he would take Mary Lou on the boat with him. Sam claimed that Mary Lou was almost fifty years old, which was and still is extraordinarily old for a do for a donkey. <clears throat> she eats nothing but raw onions. Sam would say, holding up a wide onion between his dark fingers, "It's nature's magic vegetable. If a person ate nothing but raw onions, he could live to be two hundred years old." Sam was not much older than 20, so nobody was quite sure that Mary Lou was really as old as he said she was. How would he know? Still, nobody ever argued with Sam, and whenever they were sick, they would not go not only to Doc Hawthorne, but also to Sam. Sam always gave the same advice. Eat plenty of onions. He said that onions were good for the digestion, the liver, the stomach, the lungs, the heart, and the brain. If you don't believe me, just look at old Mary Lou here. She's never been sick a day in her life. He also said many different he also had many different ointments, lotions, syrups, and paste, all made out of onion juice and different parts of the onion plant. This one cured asthma, that one was for warts and pimples, and another was a remedy for arthritis. He even had a special ointment which he claimed would cure baldness. Just rub it on your husband's head every night while he's sleeping, Mrs. Collingwood, and soon his hair will be as thick and as long as Mary Lou's tail. Doc Hawthorne did not resent Sam. The folks of Green Lake were afraid, to, were just afraid to take chances. They would get regular medicine from Doc Hawthorne and onion concoctions from Sam. And after they got over their illnesses, no one could be sure, not even Doc Hawthorne, which of the two treatments had done the trick. Doc Hawthorne was almost completely bald, and in the morning his head often smelled like onions. Whenever Catherine Barlow bought onions, she always bought an extra one or two and would let Mary Lou eat them out of her hand. Is something wrong? Sam asked her one day as she was feeding Mary Lou. You seem distracted. Oh, just the weather, said Miss Catherine. It looks like rain clouds are coming in. Me and Mary Lou, we like the sun, said Sam. Oh, I like it fine, said Catherine, as she rubbed the donkey's rough tail on top of her head. Oh, I'm sorry, rough, rough hair on top of its head. It's just that the roof leaks in the schoolhouse. Well, I can fix that, said Sam. What are you going to do? Catherine joked, fill the, fill the hole with onion parts. Sam laughed. No, I'm good with my hands, he told her. I built my own boat. If it leaked, I'd be in big trouble. Catherine couldn't help but notice his strong, firm hands. They made a deal. He agreed to fix the leafy roof in exchange for six jars of spiced peaches. It took Sam a week to fix the roof because he could only work in the afternoon after school let out and before night classes began. Sam wasn't allowed to attend classes because he was a Negro. But they let him fix the building which means, that's not a word we use, but this was 110 years ago, so it means he's African-American. 
Miss Catherine usually stayed in the schoolhouse grading papers and such while Sam worked on the roof. She enjoyed what little conversation they were able to have, shouting up and down to each other. She was surprised by his interest in poetry. When he took a break, she would sometimes read a poem to him. On one, more than one occasion, she would start to read a poem by Poe or Longfellow only to hear him finish it from memory. She was sad when the roof was finished. Is something wrong, he asked. No, you did a wonderful job, she, sa she said. It's just that the windows won't open. The children and I would enjoy a breeze now and then. Well, I can fix that, said Sam. She gave him two more jars of peaches and Sam fixed the windows. It was easier easier to talk to him than working on the window well, while he was working on the windows. He told her about his secret onion field on the other side of the lake, where the onions grow all year round and the water runs uphill. When the windows were fixed, she complained that her desk wobbled. Well, I can fix that, said Sam. The next time she saw him, she mentioned that the door doesn't hang straight, and she got to spend another afternoon with him while he fixed the door. By the end of the first semester, Onion Sam had turned the old run-down schoolhouse into a well-crafted, freshly painted jewel of a building that the whole town was proud of. People passing by would stop and admire it. Oh, that's our schoolhouse. It shows how much we value education here in Green Lake. The only person who wasn't happy with it was Miss Catherine. She'd run out of things that needed fixing. She sat at her desk one afternoon, listening to the pitter-patter of the rain on the roof. No water leaked into the classroom, except for the few drops that came from her eyes. Onions! How sweet onions! Hot sweet onions, Sam called out on the street. She ran to him, and she wanted to throw her arms around him, but couldn't bring herself to do it. Instead, she hugged Mary Lou's neck. Is something wrong? he asked her. Oh, Sam, she said, my heart is breaking. Well, I can fix that, said Sam. She turned to him. He took hold of hold of both of her hands and kissed her. Because of the rain, there was nobody else out on the street. Even if there was, Catherine and Sam wouldn't have noticed. They were lost in their own world. At that moment, however, Hattie Parker stepped out of the general store. <clears throat> they didn't see her, but she saw them. She pointed her quivering finger in their direction and whispered, God will punish you. There were no telephones, but word spread quickly through the small town. By the end of the day, everyone in Green Lake had heard that the school teacher had kissed the onion picker. Not one child showed up to school the next morning. <clears throat> Miss Catherine sat alone in the classroom and wondered if she had lost track of the day or the week. <clears throat> Perhaps it was Saturday. It wouldn't have surprised her. Her brain and heart had been spinning ever since Sam kissed her. She heard a noise outside the door, and then suddenly a mom of me mob of men and women came storming into the school building. They were led by Trout Walker. There she is, Trout shouted. That devil woman! The mob was turning over desks and ripping down bulletin boards. She's probably been poisoning your children's brains with books, Trout declared. They began piling all the books in the center of the room. Think about what you're doing, cried Miss Catherine. Someone made a grab for her, tearing her dress, but she managed to get out of the building. She ran to the sheriff's office. The sheriff had his feet up on his desk and was drinking from a bottle of whiskey. Morning, Miss Catherine, he said. They're destroying the schoolhouse, she said, gasping for breath. They'll burn it to the ground if someone doesn't stop them. Ah, oh, just calm your pretty self down a second, the sheriff said in a slow drawl, and tell me what you're talking about. He got it from his desk and walked over to her. Trout Walker has. Now don't go saying nothing bad about Charles Walker, said the sheriff. We don't have much time, urged Catherine. You've got to stop him. You're sure pretty, said the sheriff. Miss Catherine stared at him in horror. Kiss me, said the sheriff. She slapped him across the face. He laughed. You kiss the onion picker, why can't you kiss me? She tried to slap him again, but he caught her by the hand. He tried to wiggle she tried to wiggle free. You're drunk, she yelled. I always get drunk before a hanging. A hanging? Who? It's against the law for a negro to kiss a white woman. Well then you'll have to hang me too, said Catherine, because I kissed him back. It ain't against the law for you to kiss him, the sheriff explained, just for him to kiss you. We're all equal under the eyes of God, she declared. The sheriff laughed. Then if Sam and I are equal, why won't you kiss me? He laughed again. I'll make you a deal. One sweet kiss and I won't hang your boyfriend. I'll just run him out of town. Miss Catherine jerked her hand free and she hurried to the door. She heard the sheriff say, The law will punish Sam and God will punish you. She stepped back into the street and saw smoke rising from the schoolhouse. She ran down to the lakefront where Sam was hitching Mary Lou to the onion cart. Thank God I found you, she sighed, hugging him. We've got to get out of here now. What? Someone must have seen us kissing yesterday, she said. They've set fire to the schoolhouse, and the sheriff said he's going to hang you. Sam hesitated for a moment. 
as if he couldn't quite believe it. He didn't want to believe it. Come on, Mary Lou. He had to leave Mary Lou. We have to leave Mary Lou behind, said Catherine. Sam stared at her a moment. There were tears in his eyes. Okay. Sam's boat was in the water, tied to a tree by a long rope. He untied it, and they waded through the water and climbed aboard. His powerful arms towed them away from the shore. <clears throat> but his powerful, 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 sorry, arms were no match for Trout Walker's motorized boat. They were a little more than halfway across the lake when Miss Catherine heard the loud roar of the engine. Then she saw the ugly black smoke, and these are the facts. The Walker boat smashed into Sam's boat. Sam was shot and killed in the water. Catherine Barlow was rescued against her wishes. When they returned to the shore, she saw Mary Lou's body lying on the ground. The donkey had been shot in the head. That all happened 110 years ago. Since then, not one drop of rain has fallen on Green Lake. You make the decision. Who is being punished? Three days after Sam's death, Miss Catherine shot the sheriff while he was sitting in his chair drinking a cup of coffee. Then she carefully applied a fresh coat of red lipstick and gave him the kiss he'd asked for. For the next 20 years, Kiss and Kate Barlow is one of the most feared outlaws in all the West. Well, with that, I think I'm going to stop there. Pretty intense. Anyway, I hope you like it. It's pretty intense, but it's a really, really great book, and it's a great movie, too. All right, friends, happy reading.